You're watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday evening. You know, keeping with tradition on Fridays, we often have Dr. Matthew Minard, and he is back with us. He's going to be going over Jacques Maritain and his uh, life and work and all kinds of stuff. So looking forward to it. But welcome back to the show, Dr. Minard. How are you? All right. Uh, it's been it's been a little while. Uh, I feel yeah. like I feel like every time I come back, I'm beating my breast about the Summa series. Um <laughs> And, you know, it's I had a conversation just the other day and some Christological things came up and I was digging and I, I was like, well, save that one as a good little nugget for whenever you, you do uh, Michael show. Uh, there's yeah. a there's an external factor that's tying that in because I want to do my prep for that because it's going to be Christology stuff after the morals because it's something I'm editing. So I yeah. want to kind of be doing the editing. So as I'm editing, it's a Christology volume. So it'll be it'll make me think of like the themes I need to be covering and things of that sort. So that makes sense. Killed two yeah. birds, one stone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's there have been a lot there have been a lot of birds and a lot of uh, I mean, some stones. So it's been busy. It's been a real busy semester. But I mean, it's blessed work. So it's fine. But it's <laughs> good to be as, back. It feels like winter. This is a winter as, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that you were doing some skiing earlier on, on social yeah, media. Yeah. <laughs> that much. I mean, I just wanted to use my pass today. Uh, it's my, that's my winter uh, outing, but it's been warm here. I mean, it's not been fan boat warm like where you're from. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, the mountain was finally covered with snow and they were blasting the snowmakers for the weekend. But the, there were just like five. There were like you know three trails and and two slopes open. So I said to my wife, I can only do two of these medium slopes so many times. So just came home and hung out with her. Uh, you know, I comments. envy that. I wish I could do that. The best that we got was a few minutes of uh, some snow, and of course, it didn't stick to the ground or anything. But <laughs> did you get in that recent that recent storm? Yeah, it was about uh, last Sunday. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cold right now. I mean, I went outside and in my wheelbarrow, there had some been some rainwater in it and it was frozen over. So, it, oh, it's, it's wow, cold. you really are cold uh, yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was going to, I was going to compete because it's, I pulled up my thing. It's 14 degrees here. But, uh, uh, okay. Well, no, that's, that's cold. No, no, here. but I you're mean, frozen though. You're freezing. Yeah, you got water yeah. freezing. So you're like legit. This is not like the gators <laughs> are. Degrees. The gators are pulling up their gators. I mean, <laughs> I I mean 14 <laughs> degrees. Wow. Yeah. This is my limit already. I, I'm, I'm, I've had my share of the cold already. I'm, I want to go back to the heat. So <laughs> yeah, you saw that. Well, we better be careful. You know, this is going to be like, remember that time that uh, it was about last year, this time we were, we were talking about the order of things and we were talking about beer and someone was commenting. I didn't tune in here to listen to you yokels talk about beer. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a little banter i yeah, think i think so interesting yeah it breaks yeah. the eyes too so but yeah let's talk about jacques merit meritain I, I hope i'm pronouncing them correctly i've heard it a you can go times there a couple different yeah a couple different ways you can go there i mean i'm gonna be fine i'll even slip into them i mean meritain is how a lot of people say it in america right jacques meritain if you're gonna be french yeah. they're pretentious pretentious but jacques first of all so you drop your ass um yeah yeah and meritain is fine um, cause that's just, it's like saying Cajetan, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You just, you're, you're like a Brit localizing French language. You're doing that a little bit here, uh, in, in American English. You, you know, I, I can't say that I've read a whole lot from them, but I did read a few months back, a small volume. It was called liturgy and something. It was liturgy and contemplation. Yeah. 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 He really and his good. wife wrote that. Yeah, it's a really great little volume. It's about like 100 pages or so. Yeah. I think he writes it when he's in America here. Um, that, you know, he kind of gets he gets in contact with the liturgical movement people in the Midwest, or at least he's, you know, he's reading their publications, like Arate Fratres and things like that. Um, and he's, he's trying to take elements of the liturgical movement that's going on in the States, at least. Um, and he, I, it's not well footnoted, so you'd have to probably look at his letters to to see if he's reading the the French stuff that's going on, uh, which he might though, because he 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 was connected to Salem, for instance, whenever he was mm. a younger man, um, and so uh, he's combining that with that that Carmelite mysticism that he got from Garigou Lagrange, um, you know, some of the stuff about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how you know the acts of faith, open charity, 
in the liturgy are, are operative. So how is it that that prayer in that strict sense, external prayer, um, or prayer as supplicative, uh, then really is involved in the the internal prayer of you know acts of faith and acts of hope and acts of charity. Uh, and then how is the instrumentality of the liturgy involved? It's a great little volume, like 100 pages, yeah. not not technical. I yeah. think his wife was a partial author. She may have even been the original, so I'm trying to remember. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah right. it was a very, very easy read. So, I mean, I, I really recommend it. I enjoyed it. Um, it seems a little little outdated. You can tell this was before the liturgical reforms, but I think it's still applicable for today. Uh, yeah, well, if you know, if anything, you know, so a volume like that, I mean, we're going to just, I'm fine. Like, let's just start here for a bit and we'll come back to the bigger mm -hmm. picture. A volume like that gives you a really good insight to what things should have gone like, right? That was yeah. the elan of what the, the liturgical movement for reform was like prior to the council. You know, and I, I haven't kept up with the braying about this. I mean, there's more of it because of uh, Traditionis Custodes in the Western Church, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if people are hating the liturgical movement totally now, if that's a thing to do. Um <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I may, I get nervous, but I'm like, I, I always saw it as this fruitful remembrance that liturgical action is public piety that should actually be viewed as the primary function of the church, not this Jesuitical kind of, you know, bumbling around on Holy Week, not knowing what to do because it's a liturgy. Um, you know, so in any case, uh, you get a sense of what the liturgical re reform should have been like from seeing what the movement was like then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Very helpful and insightful perspective. And, you know, I from what I gather, he was pretty diverse in what he wrote. He wasn't just about liturgy and contemplation. Yeah. Right? No, no. So Meriton, this is the problem. That's a great way to put it like at the beginning here. Uh, and we didn't plan that, folks, mm. uh, uh, is to there are narratives about Meriton. All right. I I don't know if you've run across sort of the Maritan, the political liberal Saul Linsky narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. That's usually somewhere close to the general narrative that one finds in Western traditionalist circles has something to do with his political positions. And you could walk away thinking, oh, this guy just was a political philosopher. Um, uh, we may or may not get to the Alinsky thing. I'm of the opinion it's very minor um, and overblown. And it's actually, I think, misused potentially by progressive forces that want to make more out of some letters than even they merit. But Maritan actually... Uh, I mean, he is a philosopher. I mean, he's a cat. He's a Christian philosopher. That's why I chose the title of this because he's he's philosophizing in faith in a profound way. And I think that's what made me fall in love with him. And that may sound crazy because uh, it's like, well, there are a lot of philosophers. But I mean, as you know, you're finishing up doctoral work, right? And this is the same thing in theology. I mean, there were theologians, and then there were people who who are scholars. Uh, you know, theological scholars we might call them, and there are a lot of philosophical scholars out there. And, and among people who read Thomas Aquinas, there are a lot of, you know, historians or they're really kind of medievalists who like St. Thomas. And they know a lot about his sources. And they know a lot about the history of the 13th century, maybe the 14th century even. Um, but Maritan never really quite functioned like an academic. I mean, he was just a philosopher on his own. So, I mean, just a tiny bit of history. Um, he was actually born a... a if they were observant Protestant, they really were a secular family, uh, non-believing family, relatively liberal middle class. I mean, well enough to do, pretty well to do. I mean, upper middle class, really, um, family. And uh, he went to, to the Sorbonne in Paris. He, he was a secularist. He was actually a follower of someone named Henri Bergson, who's come up on this podcast, on this podcast. Sorry, I've been doing some podcasts. <laughs> it's come up here on Reason and Theology before, um, I believe. One of your right, one of the regulars. I should remember his name. Actually, it'll come back to me later. Brings up Bergson on occasion. Bergson mm -hmm. is one of these interesting, like kind of like second tier philosophers that, like, we look back and we're like, who is that? But he was incredibly influential in Paris at the turn of the century. Um, and so, if you think about this, you got a young man, very idealistic, uh, 19, 20 years old. He's uh, in love with this. Uh, Russian Jewish emigre, uh, Raisa Uzmanov, who eventually he marries. Um, and you're in the middle of a philosophical context that is incredibly post Immanuel Kant. And there are different forms of Kant, right? Like post Kantianism goes Hegel and goes idealism and, and kind of romanticism is like one of these weird, like Hegel's not even romanticism, but it's there's the romantic era, there's the kind of historical Hegelian stuff, but there's also a, a neo positivist side to Kant. 
Ernst Kassir would be like an example of this. But uh, you know, basically, you limit all human knowledge like pretty rigorously to that which can be sensed or that which can be described in sense terms, and that's it, right? That kind of positivism at the turn of the century, and that was the coin of the realm at the Sorbonne at the time. And so over at the Collège de France in Paris, uh, there's this lecturer giving uh, talks on Plotinus and kind of a whole metaphysics that he himself, Bergson, came up with that was, uh, we could call it evolutionistic. Uh, I mean, imagine if you remember kind of digging into your history of philosophy or Heraclitus, everything's in motion, everything's change. So it's it's kind of like that, but trying to to make it into a way that uh, trying to make a system that you know incorporates human freedom and spontaneity as being the the kind of end product of that. So all of evolution is a sort of like creative upsurge of evolution forward, and what we are is kind of the tip of the wave of of evolution. Uh, you, you know, kind of direct. We can direct the the flow of evolution. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but I'm trying to give an idea. Right, so because if you imagine something like that in Bergson, you could see how some young person is like, "Whoa, this is so much better than the positivism, which is just this horrible scientism that is in the air." So he becomes a Bergsonian, and this this begets a funny story. There's a, a Dominican who's at studies because you know they, the Dominicans were sending to the secular. Inst uh, institutions, and he's there for philosophical studies after ordination. Uh, Gontran, um, Reginald was his name, Reginald. Garrigou Lagrange. He saw this Slavic-looking man, he writes back in a letter to Ambrose Gardet, talking about Bergsonian morality and all this, you know, and it's what nonsense. And so we're going to leave that, that anecdote there, because 10 years later, things change quite a bit. So Maritain has a, a kind of a, an intellectual conversion with Bergson that saves him and his wife from suicide. So he and Raisa had basically said, if the world is positivism, if the world is scientism, we're going to commit suicide in, in a year or consider it. And Bergson basically opened their eyes. Um, and we're not going to talk much more about Bergson, but he's a, a kind of interesting figure. He, he may have converted on his deathbed. He hesitated during World War II. He was a Jew, uh, Jewish man who didn't want to convert publicly because of what was known about the Holocaust, but he may have converted on his deathbed because there's a lot of talk from the late 30s of, of him converting. He, he, he's writing about this. So in the course of this, and I, I just I didn't kind of prep the details of the, the conversion story for today, but the, the Maritans, um, Meet Leon Bois. So, have you ever? I don't think you've ever had on David Bentley Hart, have you? I have. You have. I mean, a man of bombast, right? Yeah. Very appro. So it's very appropriate that David Bentley Hart wrote the introduction to Leon Bois, or some people say Bloy, B L O Y. His uh, his little collection of essays called "The Pilgrim of the Absolute" by Clooney Press. Uh, Bloy is this this. Catholic radical living, I mean, right, he's, he's a, an author, uh, living in a sense like paycheck to paycheck, we might say, uh, to try and live this simple life of radical conversion to Christ in the midst of trying to also be, a, a, you know, live the aesthetic life as, as a Catholic author. And he just, he uh, inspires a number of conversions, but Maritan, he inspires and becomes his godfather and, and Reyes' his godfather. And pretty early on after his conversion, Maritain realizes all this Bergson stuff, I, I can't hold it. You're living in the world of the modernist crisis, right? The idea of uh, dogmas changing their meaning. And here you have a system of philosophy that basically says that all of reality is always changing. And at most, we kind of, it's a nominalist system. We put our, our concepts on change. And by our concepts, we sort of fix static schemas but nothing is actually fixed. Um, and so even one of the great modernists, uh, Edward um, Leroy, Leroy uh, was a Bergsonian, very close to Bergson. And Maritain just saw all this and was like, I can't, I can't be a philosopher anymore if this is what I'm doing. And so he sort of steps out of the, the idea of living an academic life. And he does some hack work for some encyclopedia editing for a little bit. And he happens upon through through um, 
I believe it was the abbot of Salem at the time, recommends to him uh, a Dominican spiritual spiritual director. I mean, this sets his whole, this sets basically his entire um, fate for the rest of his life, Humbert Clarissac, um, who was a political conservative, um, but also um, he's an ecclesiologist of sorts, and he introduces him to Thomism. And it's like a spiritual, I believe it was Clarissac. It's in this period that he gets introduced to it, at least. Um, it's like a spiritual light that floods over him, he says. I even think that it might have been Raisa who, who first gave him a copy of the Summa and said, you need to read this. And he, he by happenstance, because he's he's connected now to this Dominican, he, he gets introduced to the Dominican tradition. So all those commentators that I sometimes talk about, John of St. Thomas, Cajetan, um, Biluar, others, he he reads he starts reading them as well and so 10 years after the famous garagu moment whenever it might be his book anti-modern anti-modern his first published book uh which is interesting so maritan the horrible modernist in certain traditionalist eyes his first book is anti-modern he's he's a manifesto against the errors of modernity um garagu wherever he runs across maritan he's like wait a second this is the guy who I, I remember being a Bergsonian of like, you know, strict observance back whenever I was in college. Who, how in the world is he not only like a, a Catholic, but a Thomist, and he's a Thomist like Dominicans. And so Maritain said, and then maybe we can, maybe I'll just, you can poke around a little bit at this. He said, my vocation was to take scholastic thought and, and to introduce it again into the Elan of problems today into the questions today. And I mean, you know, he had to beat around for work a bit in the Catholic world and he taught at the Institute, Catholic Institute. So he did lectures on modern philosophy and he wrote a book crit critiquing Descartes. He wrote some introductions to philosophy. He was gonna do a whole series, but I think they realized that he, he didn't know how to write textbooks because his textbooks would go on these big digressions that were like te too technical for a textbook. So read his his logic book, uh, his his formal logic, and it's good, very good, but too technical at points. Uh, so that kind of got cut off before he even got to like natural philosophy. He gave lectures on it, but didn't write a book. Um, but he he also was kind of independent, independently wealthy because someone left him money, uh, someone who he had kept ex spiritual exchanges with during World War One, uh, a soldier who died. Um, willed to him his estate. And uh, so that gave him a flex kind of flexibility. And so he became an author of texts and his first uh, published text uh, was, was I believe it was anti modern That's what I've always t told myself. Although actually in his bio bibliography today, so that's what I had thought it was, uh, but he actually wrote a critique of Bergson about that early as well. And so it's, it's sort of a manifesto against the French idealism of his time read from the light of Thomism. And as you read, especially like the second edition of that text, you see that like he, he digests the like, Garagu's stuff, the stuff he says about God, the stuff he says about freedom. It's like a digest of stuff that's in Garagu's book on freedom or on, on God. I'm sorry. But then he says, well, there are other issues. And he, he ends up hanging around artists and he writes a number of works in aesthetics or theories of mm -hmm. art. And I think that really among the Thomas theories of art, that stuff is probably at least, it's the best for planting seeds for the direction you have to go. Um, the finest flower of that tradition can be found in Marie Dominique Philippe, tragic figure, but he's, he's much in that same line. Um, a, a lot of the other stuff that's just historical about aesthetics and Thomas is, is kind of flyover country because Thomas doesn't have an aesthetic theory, he has the pieces for an aesthetic theory. And so Maritain really mold, melds together, I, I think a wonderful work in this tradition. There are a couple others in that period that haven't made it to English, but I just recently retaught those texts for the Lyceum Institute, they're great. He also is involved politically because pretty early on he is he is a, a uh, kind of political conservative because of Dom Clarissac. I do this to you all the time. I say, we're going to come to something and I'm going to let you ask me questions. And then I keep going, but I want to give you like the, I need to give you like the works. And then I don't realize how much backstory I need because then you can poke, but okay. So try to be quick here. Clarissac gets him tied up with the French conservatives of French action, L'Action Francaise. And eventually they get condemned right at the end of the uh, the twenties. And that actually, it starts a split between he and Garagou. He and Garagou actually then meet, and Garagou is 
preaching retreats for him, but the politics starts to split them. Garrigou accepts the condemnation of French action, but it's a cross for him because he's more of a he's more of a conservative by temperament. Maritain was always a bit of a liberal um, because of his, his upbringing in in his you know, his kind of family. He he used to hang out in the cupboard behind the stairs with the working staff in the house, you know, and talk socialist revolutions with them. He was no socialist. I mean, I can find enough places where he condemns that, but you can see that there's much more. He's more of a man of of the left, and I, there's enough latitude in Catholicism to actually allow you to do that. Not everyone has to be a monarchist, um, especially outside of France. But this is the oddities of of conservatism and Catholicism. So he actually turns pretty briskly and he reevaluates this and he writes a book that is in English as the things that are not Caesar's. It's a very good book. Eventually he writes some other things like integral humanism. And that's where you start to get the stuff that the traditionalists start to particularly dislike. So he does this political philosophy stuff. Um, but it's like, I know my shelf better than I know this list that I have made up here. So I'm like looking up cause you do it too. You look up and about, uh, he, uh, he did stuff in morals, moral philosophy. Uh, he has a very interesting theory about how really moral philosophy is impossible as philosophy without the consideration of theological data because of our state of existence. Um, stuff on the natural law that's, that's interesting and he's doing new things with it. He does, he, he's part of this whole current of emphasizing the idea of the act of existence or essay in Aquinas and his metaphysics. Someone like the historian Etienne Gilson pounds this home. And for this reason, Maritain comes to be called an existential Thomist, but it's not a helpful term. Maritain, in the end, is a classical Thomist who's trying to do new things while trying to stay, stay faithful to the school, is how to think of him. Uh, but his great work, and it's your, your readers would have to really suffer through it to, to get through it. I'm saying that because I remember the first time I read it, but it covers it all. In a sense, you want to get the soul of Maritain, you read the degrees of knowledge. Let me get my copy, actually, because it's so wonderfully beat up. I've read, uh, you probably, I think you can probably hear me because my microphone is pretty good. Yeah, now. yeah, I uh, can hear you. This poor copy, now it was in a book bag that got wet when I was in graduate school. But there are some pages in here. Um, friend of mine, Brandon, when we lived together, he would laugh because I would be reading something out of it to him. And I'd have like everything underlined except the thing I found important that day. I mean, you've got pages in this thing that have like levels of underlining. It's, you know, there's the, the pencil and then there's a dark uh, black and then there's the blue read and there's a different pencil it looks like. Um, this book, my dad, my stepfather, may he rest in peace. Uh, when I would come back from DC and sometimes have it with me, you know, he'd be like this, the, the face, the face haunts my dreams. He's what he would say to me. Uh, I read this when I was in seminary and it changed my life. I was not a, I was kind of anti Thomist and this book changed it all for me because I saw, wow, he deals with, okay. Yeah. The problem of like the possibility of metaphysics, but philosophy and experimental science, the issues of epistemology and critical realism, more things on the philosophy of science and the philosophy of nature and the connection connection between the philosophy of nature and metaphysics. And then the whole second half is devoted to kind of a, a philosophical theological, but it's more like being a philosophical research worker consideration of uh, the noetics, the theory of knowledge, the epistemology of mystical experience. And here he's drawing so much on that line of Ambrose Gardet and and Garrigou Lagrange and the, the Carmelites, uh, it's just amazing. Mis his chapters on mystical experience and theology, the chapter called Augustinian Wisdom is just amazing here about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A, chap a chapter on St. John of the Cross, practitioner of contemplation. Another thing I love about him is that whole page is a footnote. And he has books that are, he has books that are like multi-page footnotes. And Garrigou was like that actually too. And Yves Simone, uh, Maritain's sort of student, sort of protege, would have would have these footnotes that go on for pages. Uh, like here, both of these pages are, it's like all excursus. It's footnote on both sides and just a teeny bit of text at the top. And what's the t the title again? So this is again, The Degrees of Knowledge. The Degrees of Knowledge, gotcha. It is for all the suffering you would do to understand it, not you, but one, that one would do to understand it. I've met many people who say the exact same thing I did. It's like, I, I read it and didn't understand it. 
you get like 10% of it, you get a lot. I mean, it is just, it's beautifully written. Uh, you have to get this edition, not, not necessarily this, there's a hardback, but you need to get Gerald Phelan's translation, the Notre Dame edition. Maritan himself critiqued publicly the first translation from Scribner. So it needs to be from the 1950s onward is all. Um, and then the final chapter is Toto Inada, you know, all or nothing. And it's this, this uh, meditation on the apophatic knowledge that we have through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and faith. So it's a kind of epistemology as a Christian philosopher that runs all the way from like the, the sciences dealing with phenomena all the way up to the capacities of human intellection made possible only because of grace's activity. Um, you know, you sense here, therefore, that he really is a philosopher philosophizing in faith. And so he's always on the edge of theological topics um, because he's trying to live the vo his vocation in relation to the questions that intrigue him. He knows the distinction between reason and faith, um, and yet he can't help but butt up onto this edge and find himself being a kind of research worker for theology. So I'm going to just kind of leave it there. Oh, one last, no, just remind me as we get there that we got to get to the end of his life um, just to talk about maybe because it'll help us to narrativize this. But he, very quick end of life is, he, end up, he ends, ends up having to come to the States because of World War II. This is, of course, the period of the Vichy government. He's, of course, very anti-Vichy. This exacerbates his relationship with Garagu and other conservative uh, folks in, in Rome. Uh, and then... Uh, Eventually, his wife dies while he's in America, 50s or early 60s. And he comes back to Paris and eventually, to lose, actually, and he eventually becomes the little brother of Jesus. He dies at age 93, and he was professed as a religious at the end of his life. He lived as a hermit at the end of his life. So, okay. I just, yeah, I'll have you poke because there's so much. Like, he covers so much. And it, it, it so influenced me. I read all of his stuff in graduate school multiple times to the point that people used to call me that Maritan guy is what they used to call me, <laughs> dismissively, because they were all from Thomas Aquinas College, and they all kind of hate Maritan. <laughs> so sp that that's kind of where I wanted to go next. Those who hate Maritan, especially some traditionalists who have concerns with them, what, what exactly are they concerned with? Yeah, so the big concern is on questions of religious liberty. Um, you know, it, how, to what degree is he in line with um, someone like John Courtney Murray and Murray's approach to religious liberty? And I've thought about revisiting this because they're not quite simpatico, um, but Maritan does have a, a bit of a minimalizing idea of what a vitally Christian state would look like. Um, you know, the idea of like a Christian democracy is, is more open in him. You wouldn't have a confessional state in order to have a, a society that's vitally animated by a Christian spirit that ultimately recognizes the church. Um, if you ever read, if you ever read the little book by Jean Daniel Lou, uh, on prayer as a political problem, it's a very conflicted text because he wants to acknowledge how Christendom is necessary, but it can't be like the Christendom of old. It reminds me very much of the same kind of thing that's bothering Mer like Maritan. He can't quite articulate how can you ultimately recognize re the revealed religion that if it's suitably proposed and yet not have some kind of fully integral state. Um, and now I haven't, you know, I haven't had to teach integral humanism uh, and I haven't, so I haven't read it since I was in graduate school, actually that, that volume, because in some ways it's, because it's le public lectures, it's not his most profound work, but from the time he delivers those lectures down in Buenos Aires, he's marked as being someone who's, who's basically against the, uh, who's a religious liberty guy, which is a problematic position. I mean, you have to articulate anything you say about religious liberty just correct so that you don't run afoul of you know, traditional church themes. Um, you know, not merely even the papal magisterium of the 19th century, but, you know, they're or orthodox thinkers because of scissor papism or in a sense, just as integralist, just in a different way. Um, and so the, there's, a, there's a real sense that he basically falls into a kind of liberalism right? Classical liberalism, not liberal like we tend to use it here in our, our um, uh, in American politics, but liberal as, you know, effectively human liberty and choice as individuals marks out the whole of what our social, social interaction is. And especially too, that there would be no real secular realization or rec recognition of, of religion. And he's accused of this publicly by, his name is Jules, I think it's Jules 
De Mineville. And the problem is it's such a German name, kind of French spelled though. And he's, he's somewhere in South America. I forget where he is in South America, if he's in, in uh, Brazil or where. And there's some private correspondence that Garagu has actually with this author in, in South America. And uh, the Jules de Mineville, uh, basically he publishes Garagu's stuff in partial form publicly. And Garagu gets so mad at him that he he, make, he writes him and makes him publish his redactions. Because Garagu said, you're correct that, that Maritain's politics are deeply problematic, but he's you can't say he's making the same liberal mistakes as someone like uh, Laminet. And that's a normal thing to do in traditional circles is to say in the end, Maritain's a political liberal. So there's that bit. There's also kind of the new traditionalists. So it's like the the conservative Catholics of America who are becoming more trad friendly. And this is becoming even more of a sociological thing because of certain factors going on in the liturgical life of the Roman church that are very much, they question his approach to the common good and society. They believe that he thinks in the end that the private individual good, um, kind of individual perfection supersedes the common good of society. Um, and this is because of a little book called The Person and the Common Good and a, a, a huge polemic that broke out between, have you ever, has anyone ever come on here to talk about Charles DeConnick? Mm -hmm. uh, just the DeConnick circle is getting bigger and bigger of late, I notice. And uh, I, I have nothing against DeConnick except this. He wrote a broadside called The Common, oh gosh, uh, The Primacy of the Common Good, I have to think now, uh, but it's against the personalists. Is, is I believe the subtitle. And it's a, it is a cludging read. It's a difficult read to get through where he's trying to argue against personalist philosophy today that's putting the human person and individual and personal perfection above kind of social, like the justice and the social character of man, the ordination of the human person, in other words, the common good. So there, it's a kind of liberalism that you're making the individual sovereign and not ultimately seeing polit the political community as, as the highest public rationality um except he doesn't ever accuse for instance maritan and it gets kind of attached to maritan and so eve simone uh who was maritan's protege writes this wonderful kind and yet blistering review of the book um it, at one point he says you know at, at points it feels like the conics text you need to translate his his aquinas passages back into latin to understand the hasty translations but what's more and this is what's important is as for the the positions of maritan on the common good the book has nothing to do with that but as for um the conics views they're fine they actually substantially agree with what maritan thinks and so you know it's good to have an articulation of it so i mean in the end he tries to be positive that way Privately, DeConnick said something to Maritan, and it seems like this is well attested. Or he said this to Simone in Notre Dame at South Bend in South Bend. He told him, Oh, I don't have time to read Maritan. I've never read him. So I don't understand how someone wrote a book that doesn't name Maritan, that everyone thinks is aimed at Maritan, that to this day everyone treats as though it's against Maritan when Clearly, the art argument itself doesn't hit him. I mean, there may be some points of critique and difference, but it's not like it doesn't map the argument. And the guy who wrote it admits, as far as we can tell, that he had not really read Maritan. And so he's not guilty of, of accusing Maritan of anything because he never did. And yet people in this generation kind of accuse Maritan of being, a, in the end, a kind of liberal because he doesn't see the primacy of the common good. And this drives me insane. Like, I can get a critique of certain things politically in Maritan. I don't get this... There's Maritan evil on politics, and then, like for instance, the Taconic Common Good side. I have a lot of battle scars from from graduate school because I felt like these conversations would just happen, and if I mentioned Maritan, people would just stop listening to anything I said about Aquinas uh, because I was a Maritan guy. Um, I, I very much think that that's just pernicious, it, but it's like the it's like so much in the in the church today. One other thing then as well, he was co-opted by a lot of liberals because in a sense, he was kind of a liberal temperament, right? He's, they, they never quite saw that he was being very conservative, Thomas, because he was reading John St. Thomas and everyone, but he was doing new things and his politics were liberal. And after the council, though, all of a sudden people kind of turned on him because then he writes this kind of recollection in 68 called The Peasant of the Garonne when he's living in, in back in Paris or in uh, France. 
where he he even calls out the spirit of the council like that language about the spirit of the council he, he he's like this is insane he's very not anti-conciliar but he he sees the insanity and he says this is just like kneeling before the world um so you know you'll find so you'll find people who try and tie him in for example with like tear de chardin which is insanity because he has 50 pages of anti terror stuff in the peasant like he just like an old crazy man gets on this like rant about Teilhard, you know, kind of like how von Hildebrand does. So there are these couple couple different things. We probably could come up with one or two others. Um, one other stupid one is the Nouvelle Theologie. I've actually read people say he was pro Nouvelle, Nouvelle Theologie. All the historians have the letters that show that he was supporting the people who were it the Revue Thomiste. Um, and he basically says Garrig is right in substance, even. Uh, but you got you younger guys are putting it better. Uh, Labradette, all those guys we talked about in the lecture last year. Uh, so you see, that's like, these are these ideas that are floating out there. Um, you know, and probably to this day, there still is a kind of progressive, we could say progressive conservative who likes Maritain a little bit more, but that's because he was just engaged in problems and not a stultified academic or a stultified conservative. We've all met those scholastics or those Thomists who just repeat the same things out of Thomas and that's it. Uh, that was not him. So, okay, long answer, but. Well, <clears throat> This is where, you know, I, I guess kind of where I want to go next is for somebody who is new to Maritan, where should they start? Yeah, where to where to begin with him? Yeah. So I don't want to say, say like his his introduction to philosophy. You know, you would think I'd have like an answer to this, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard. You know where you start is you should start with something that's far more accessible, like his book on Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. So it's written, it's written, I think, around the time of Studiorum Ducem in the 20s. Um, yeah, the book on Thomas Aquinas would be good. Um, you know what would be good too, though? Art and Scholasticism. Hmm. Art and Scholasticism, the aesthetics book, I think would be very good. And then there's a little book called Man's Approach to God. So if you kind of like, don't worry about all the philosophical details that are under the hood, but it's a lecture. He he would he was on the circuit giving it, although they they published it at. Um, uh, St. Vincent actually college of all places. Cause they had the rights. Um, man's approach to God would be good. And then if you're a little bit more historically inclined actually, and you want to kind of like see his reflections at the end of his life, the peasant of the Garonne might work because it's a, it's a reflect, it's a kind of in a reflective tone, the peasant of the Garonne. Okay. We put Maritan peasant that would come up. After that, then you, you're, you're going to start getting into, yeah, I'd have to think. You know, there's, yeah, even the politics stuff, it gets, starts getting somewhat difficult. But man in the state, if you've got some political philosophy, um, you know, there's some things I'd critique about the text. But you're going to get a feeling for his political philosophy if you read man in the state. Because he gave that as a series of lectures in Chicago. So, yeah. I'm looking... Um... Looking at him on the shelf over there is Moral Philosophy Volume, pretty thick book. Um, how is that? In, in fact, I also yeah. heard that John Paul II was influenced by it. Is that correct? Oh, I actually didn't know. I didn't know he was influenced by that Maritan, actually. Um, I bet he would, probably wasn't influenced by that volume. He might have been influenced by, gosh, the moral philosophy stuff that's more diffuse in the earlier works. Um, okay. Cause that, that volume, I mean, he could have been, but it'd be a little bit strange. I don't know actually, cause of the age difference, that yeah. book comes from the fifties. Mm -hmm. It was, it was actually his lectures at Princeton. Uh, and so it's got kind of a summary of, you know, moral, moral philosophy from Socrates all the way up through Hegel. Um, and I mean, it's good. It's actually quite different for him. Um, you're going to get, you're going to see him through the cracks of him doing that philosophy. Uh, but it's a little bit like those early volumes. It's dangerous in the sense that it, it gets technical sometimes out of nowhere, you know, because he, he just can't with, withstand himself. Like he, he writes, he writes for himself or his level. Sometimes he has a harder time, I think, hitting the level. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that, if you did his morals text, that's the one that you would, you would want to start with. Um, because uh, it's not it's not kind of dealing with specifically philosophical problems here and there. Preface to Metaphysics is good. Um, little book on metaphysics, if you've got a bit of metaphysical chops. Um, it's, it's deceptive because it's just some lectures. So, like, it looks like it's some guy come up with his own thing and you don't realize what it's based on, you know? 
because he doesn't footnote it all that much. But so, do you have? Do you have? You're saying the moral philosophy. You're seeing it on your own shelf over across yeah. the way. Yeah, I have it over there. Yeah. Oh, it's just funny because it's like you're looking kind of like I do. It's like right there. Yeah. Like, yes, it is. <laughs> like it is big on that shelf. But there's if you're seeing that, Michael, you have a drone in my house because my yeah. camera's never getting over there. It's not over there. It's <laughs> on the other side. Yeah, I got a bunch of books on that one and that one, so I can I can kind of see you know make out most of the titles. Uh, it's a big, yeah, it's a hefty book. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I should revisit it. It's been a while since I read it. You know, some of his brilliant stuff is it's it's a little bit in degrees, and then it's in a book called Science and Wisdom. His notion of moral philosophy adequately considered is I think profound because he's not someone who thinks you can just kind of do a natural law ethics all by itself. I mean, he's a natural mm -hmm. law guy, mm -hmm. but he takes very seriously the fact that moral philosophy can't exist in independence from theology. Um, mm -hmm. There are people, I mean, I've had people strain. I've published on this. I've had people kind of strenuously get down my throat on it, that it slurs faith and reason together too much. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the only approach to these questions that's acceptable. And I feel good because Garagu agreed with him publicly um, I remember when I read that, I was uh, in a talk that Eric gave that I translated. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it continues to confirm my thesis that, mer you know, it's it's not this simple, but it's my narrative that I have to start doing. It'll be my shtick that Maritan is the true inheritor of uh, Garrigo. The But it, it, it is because if you go through it, it's like Maritan is connected to these other Dominicans who do take up the Garrigou line. Labradet, Nicola, um a little bit of Brooke Berger, but the two Nicola brothers, um, trying to think, had one other in my mind. Uh, but the oh, Journet, who's not a Dominican, but Cardinal Journet, um, they're all Maritanians, but they're they're all they, they take the Garagou stuff basically as a boilerplate and they just go and develop it. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. Speaking of him, <clears throat> we have a question here from Emmanuel. He says, I heard Maritain and Garagou stopped getting along at one point is this true if so yeah. why did this happen yeah so that's in uh, it's in the notebooks you see it um 35 or 37 it's a beautiful passage um they they have a they have a falling out it's at first around things regarding like franco and spain you know that's one of the few things the political philosophy stuff where maritan starts to get in trouble is the there publicly and he actually pulls an article or two. If you go into his collected works, there are two articles that are in it, at least two articles. I remember running across them that were written not supporting the conservatives in Spain. And and that's all the more I'm going to say just because I, I only got to skim them. I was doing something totally different. And so I just I probably have them in some file somewhere. Uh, but he pulled them. He didn't publish them because whatever Bishop said that, that you know didn't kind of toe the line as he should. And they started having conversations so tragically it was like right after Maritan writes and dedicates a section of this book to Garrigo and they have a fight even where I, I forget exactly how it goes but Merit or Garrigo says something to him like you know how dare you 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 know you're but a convert and you have no right to speak on these things politically you know kind of like you're Johnny come lately to Catholicism you don't understand how the church interacts politically um you, you know you ex-liberal um and you know Let's not throw, it's like so weird. I tried to split the balance here though. I don't want to throw Garrigo under the bus. If you grew up under the anti-clerical laws in France, where where even the religious orders are, are driven out, um, you would be you would be very hesitant about like Republican France. <laughs> you really wouldn't like it. Um, and so you really have this boil from the 20s as the French action gets condemned that continues into the 30s. And so between the two of them, it does come to a real head there. And they'll start thinking about the events after that, right? So maybe it's 37, actually, because this is, I think, 35, and they're still talking and cordial. Uh, somewhere in there, there's a falling out. Now, I'd be very careful. There may have been some machinating by Garrigou in Rome, but Garrigou also was, I mean, he cited Maritain's person in the common good in the 40s, which makes me just think he could not have been trying to get him fully condemned. He could, was probably, you know, just trying to, to get him to stop. He wanted him to stop teaching politi politics. I mean, he even tried to intercede with people to, like intermediaries to tell him, you know, talk about metaphysics, talk about um, sciences, talk about mystical experience. Don't talk about politics. That's just, you're not good there. Um, and uh, so uh, 
they they eventually stopped talking. Um, I think that there was a little bit of indirect communication through Charles Journet, then Monsignor Journet and Maritain. They were they were very close. They had like six volumes of correspondence. Um, and Maritain writes in his journals. They're called his note the notebooks. Um, they're published in English. You can actually find them online. They're on the um, Maritain Center at Notre Dame's website. He, he says, you know, I'm going to leave these pages as they are. You know, they have the, the harshness of tone that came with the period, and it's harsh, but not that harsh. Um, and uh, he he says, you know, I, here at these end of years, I, I hear that Father Garagu, you know, he had just died not long after he was, not long before Maritain was writing this, that he suffered greatly at the end of his life, and he had accepted the suffering. I know this on, on good terms. I don't know if it was from... Emune or uh, Ganyabe, one of the, the Dominicans close to him, Maritain heard about it. And Garrig, he had he had significant mental and physical debilitation his last couple of years. Um, and he offered it up as a, a sacrifice. And Maritain said, you know, I, I pray to him as one among the saints now. Um, and I, I don't think that he held ill will against Garrigo. And I don't think Garrigo held Ill, held ill will. I think he was infinitely politically frustrated and then there was also the whole thing that we didn't talk about, World War II. The Vichy, that just caused such terrible things for the France psyche, psyche, the, the Hitler government. The concert, many people in France love the Vichy government until they didn't love them. Like, so historically, people need to like realize there weren't a lot of clean hands in that regard. Um, but there were people who supported de Gaulle from the beginning, and that was uh, or you know, at least the resistance side from the beginning, and that was that included people like Maritain. And so that really amped up some of the negativity on Maritain's side. And I think that there's a sense in which probably Maritain didn't talk to him after that because of that fact, um, which is still interesting because after World War II, Garrigou cites Maritain on two occasions, I think, warmly, warmly, on things that are quasi-moral. Like, so that's just interesting to me. But the French, in a sense, can't do anything without first being political, as someone said to me once, <laughs> right? Politics is like everywhere. And it's like, to this day, people don't like Garrigou, I think not because of the Nouvelle Theologie thing, because that's more complex than anyway, as we, as we know from our lectures. Um, it's because of the politics. You know, if you supported Vichy, even if you were doing it from Rome, and so you knew nothing about what was going on with the Jewish people at, at some point there, um, Still, like to this day, you're kind of forbidden. We don't we don't want to touch that conservatism. So, I mean, it was it was unfor it was unfortunate. Um, he cites him up to the end of his life, though, and some of his late, late, late life stuff. I mean, it's he even refers to Sense Commune. You can buy my book. Hold on, you can buy my book right there. Got to Mister Common Sense. He writes in Peasant of the Garon, uh, where he's kind of critiquing the craziness of his day. He says, you know, that's among like one of the three books he says that were honest and good Thomism. Is that a book by Gilson, the, um, oh my goodness, Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, Kloitchen's book, books on um, the theology in the Middle Ages and philosophy in the Middle Ages, and then that, that volume. Uh, so it's, you see, it's complex. And hence, this is why I don't like simple narratives and I need my own narrative. And so my like narrative of Maritain evil, hate Garrigou, liberal philosopher, modernist, I'm just going to have Maritain, the inheritor of Garrigou. I mean, I don't want to do that because it's too simple and it's too political. But if I have to do that, I mean, I'll just torch that. I can hear the braying and howling. I'm probably like now a modernist in certain people's eyes. So <laughs> the, the modernist Garrigou translator. Right, there you go. <laughs> Colin is asking, does Maritain's understanding of religious liberty contradict the prior magisteria? Um, Colin, out of fairness, does Dignitatis Humanae contradict the previous magisterium? Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, I mean, you know, may, I'd have to really look textually. Okay, does he go further? I, you know, I basically have to square that circle. That's my approach to this, is that you have to. I mean, I'm not a, I, I'm not a, an anti-conciliar traditionalist on this. Um, I admit it's a hard circle to square, but you just got to do it. Um, and to do that, you you sometimes have to really read things away, but so be it. Um, he, I mean, he skirts the line, I will say. He does skirt the line just as much as Dignitatis Humanae skirts the line. He he saw in Dignitatis Humanae a, a, an articulation of his position, I would say. 
is is the best way to put it. It's not. I mean, it's, I'd have to reread Integral Humanism again. It's not the same. It's not a major theme in him. There's an essay in Man and the State. There's probably some stuff in the untranslated French essays from the 40s. Maybe something in scholasticism and politics in one of the essays gathered in there. And then it's going to, it will sort of suffuse integral humanism, but integral humanism is not a, I mean, it's, it's trying to do a new kind of integralism of sorts and it's lectures. So it's less technical. So it's not a hugely central thing. That's where I don't get, I don't get this. I'm not trying to dismiss your question, Colin. That's you're, 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 it's, it is, it's dignitati humani in a sense. This is as close as I would, I would say. Um, so I feel like it's like, it's like a loaded answer from me because it depends on someone's mood with Vatican II. Does that contradict the earlier magisterium? I don't think Maritain had a desire to contradict the earlier magisterium, but he skirted way up, like skirts way up there. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And of course the issue of if the later magisterium contradicts something from a prior magisterial teaching which one would you give assent to <laughs> yeah exactly. a lot of people just yeah. over simplistically assume that you would go with the one in the past that's not necessarily the case um <clears throat> i wonder if that's maybe being assumed in the question though i don't know yeah so i mean sometimes it's assumed in that debate at least let's not put it on the question but sure on topic, i don't know about definitely... colin's perspective yeah i don't know colin and his view but and I'm colin's saying, been a good he's been a good yeah. listener i mean he's been here multiple times so i, I really am just... not trying to dismiss it sure. it's, yeah. it's 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 he that topic suffers from what the traditionalists see in it right. but I, I really think someone needs to write like just a, a flat out like i need to go through the whole works and do that it's just and i i'm not kind of not my thing i just you know but I, it would be interesting to see where all does he talk about it in what context and what exact exactly does he say but i think you'd also need to go through the letters um because you'd have to see what charles journey and he were writing to each other because journey wrote this book in the 40s called um the exigencies the the demands the requirements of politics by christianity like what does Christianity to require of politics? It's like an 800 page book and it's going to be simpatico with Maritain. So it's like a lens for viewing that. I'd have to go and read that and read what, how Journey reads the old adage that the state has the duty to receive revelation when suitably permitted, uh, uh, proposed. Like mm -hmm. how did, how do they, cause he and Journey were very close on those questions and that stuff in the ecclesiology volumes. That's just the best way to read that. And I've actually not gone back to that since I was in grad school. I kind of wasn't the in thing at the time. So I just remember reading it when I was there, but I, I never focused on it um, because if I'm uncomfortable with that, I'm going to say, well, okay, it was all them preconciliar trying to figure out how to slightly deal with the problem of the non-coercibility of the act of faith, which, you know, if you see that is what the object of all, all of what Dignitatis Humanae is about, and you take out some of the rhetoric, like about it being a positive good, I, I, that's, that's correct. That's correct that you can't coerce the act of faith. Um, but okay. yeah, anyway, sorry, it's like kind of dancing around a little bit, but no, it's fine. So there's another question here about whether or not, um, what did he actually write about his own conversion story? If so, where? Yeah, well, you'll find bits of the conversion story in, um, well, it'll be in the note in the notebooks. So if you look up the notebooks, you'll find that. Um, I think it's, it goes back to that. The There's his wife's volume, We Have Been Friends Together, which someone once said kind of like, they tried to accuse him because he was a Josephite. After they converted, they were a Josephite uh, couple. And someone tried to claim publicly at a Maritan conference, actually, which was so crazy that, that they didn't even understand marriage because of, you know, because of them being Josephites. Um, but and it shows in the title, we've been friends together, like we've been friends, but not spouses, but it's actually, she's talking about her. It's actually in French, our great, the great friendships. It's all the friends that they had early in their life. <laughs> she's not even talking about she and Jacques. I mean, they are as kind of the main friends of a sort, but, um, you get a real good sense of it there. Uh, yeah, you can, if you read that book, there's a republication of it by, um, uh, St. Benedict's, um, St. Augustine's press, that's a good place to go is actually his wife's recollection of that. 
is good. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying any other questions. Oh, We're almost well, out of time. But, but one yeah, other go, book. Go ahead. One other book too, though, to get a kind of a summary of some of that stuff is mm -hmm. McInerney's. Although Ralph McInerney critiques him in certain ways, the very rich hours of Jacques Maritain. What's uh, that? It's a it's a kind of spiritual biography of Maritain by Ma Ralph McInerney. So it has it goes all the way through though, kind of his spiritual life, um, you know, throughout all of his various writing. So the con but the conversion is is covered there at the beginning and his early spiritual direction and all all that as well. He was a he was a Benedictine oblate, so you get to hear about all of that stuff early on. That's why he was into the whole liturgical movement stuff. It was because he had this liturgical piety from being a Benedictine oblate. Um, <clears throat> any uh, con concluding remarks that we maybe didn't get a chance to touch on? Uh, I mean, not as a concluding remarks. I would just say, like, you know, one doesn't have to be a partisan, right? There are a lot of great figures in in French Thomism of this time. Um, Gilson, uh, Maritain, Charles de Conic at Laval. You also have people like Joseph Pieper, quite a little bit different. Um, and nobody needs to be a partisan among these folks. And I, I say if, you, if you're if you inclined to not give Jacques Maritain a, uh, a fair shake, you, you should. You should actually consider trying to, to delve. And if you've got some philosophical chops, I mean, delve into a work like the Degrees of Knowledge or something harder. Um, or if you, you think that he was a, a modernist, read his Peasant of the Garonne and see the state of soul of someone who was a traditional Thomist. And remember this, that's my closing remark. Maritain is not an existential Thomist. He is not a personalist Thomist. He is not a neo-scholastic. He even himself said, if anything, I'm a paleo-scholastic. He is a member in, the, in a sense of the, the kind of lay vanguard, the layman vanguard of the Thomist school. And this is a new phenomenon in history. Because the Thomists of the Thomist school were Dominicans, commenting on, on Aquinas, commenting sometimes on the commentaries on Aquinas. So some of the great lights that I've talked about before, like John Capralis or Silvestro, uh, Frances Francesco, Silvestro Ferrara, um, Cajetan, and other, John of St. Thomas. Well, he takes that patrimony quite seriously to the end of his life. He, he's very different than the post-conciliar Thomists who hate the school because it's too Baroque. Um, he, he takes that up and applies it to today. And he's in a sense, a paleo Thomist who's just answering new questions. Um, and if you want to model, not necessarily for someone who to copy on every position, but the model of how someone can philosophize in the faith, what does that look like? You know, to see that as someone fulfilling their vocation, Maritain's the man to go to. And so give him a fair shake. Um, I think it deserves deserves a fairer shake than he can get that he sometimes gets from certain conservative circles. Um, Maritain will very much teach you how to be a faithful Catholic philosopher, um, and and kind of the gate, the step that you should have at least, so that you don't fall into that terrible scholastic. What was the mind of Saint Thomas on that? Very important, but you know sometimes that's like what John Dealey used to say. God rest his soul on this fifth anniversary of his passing. Uh, he would say that it's a bunch of rear view mirror scholasticism that you're just worried about the past and, and you're not even concerned at all about the problems of today. Um, if that, if you have no answers for questions that are being asked today, and you're basically saying all questions today are false questions. I, I can't see how that's a, actually a Christian attitude. Um, you know, a, a Christian can recognize the stupidities and follies of today. Um, but then extend their hand and say, you know, let's move here. And you know what? Here is the answering answer to your suffering. And it's not to go back to the 13th or 14th century. Um, you know, the, the, there's a great period in the in the Latin West. But, you know, note to my Latin brethren, it's like the Latin 13th and 14th century might have been great for you. But the Latin church isn't the whole story either. So there is no golden age. But we're also living in a rather bad age. <laughs> Um, it's, and as Maritain himself said, the age we're living in after the council, immediately after the council and how much worse it is today is something that makes the modernist crisis look like an outbreak of hay fever in comparison. So I I'd say go to Maritain, you know, go to Maritain. It's like that, that thing that, and I'll be done. Leo the 13th said, taking from 
Genesis, but applying it to Thomas. He said, you know, just as was said of old about Joseph, the patriarch, ite ad Joseph, you know, to go to Joseph, you know, ite ad Tomum, go to Thomas, uh, ite ad, ad Ite ad Jacobum, you know, go to uh, Jacques Maritain as well. So, all right. Thanks, Michael. It's great. Thanks great to be back. On, I hope, yeah. hope we'll be back in some something here on occasion. So I'm not avoiding you at all or any of you guys. It's just, you know, life has been crazy busy. So, yeah, I'd love to have you back on. Always an honor. Uh, one last thing, if I can pitch my books, because it's exciting. Even though I would yeah. say Made by God, Made for God, I still want to recommend the Moral Theology text. Um, the exciting new one is... Hold on my fingers. These two placards here, 1,500 pages of Garagoo right wow. there going to come out in a month and a half on Divine Revelation. Uh, wow. So it's in the catalog for Emmaus, uh, and it's at the printer. And so uh, buckle up, kids. you got a lot to read this year. Well, I look forward to having you on to talk about them. When yeah, yeah. Say, so get me on and get yourself a copy from Emmaus so that we can have a talk. So that will be awesome. All Great. right. Well, thanks for coming on. And everybody, thank you all for watching. As I always say, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support what we're doing, we'll see you all later. God bless.